Well, good morning. good morning. Isn't it great to be in the house of the Lord? I mean, how, how cool is that? That God would allow us to come in and worship Him? It's just amazing to me. I love seeing you here. I'm so glad to have you here. Uh, whether you're visiting for the first time, whether you're here every week, it doesn't matter. We are glad to have you in the house of the Lord. Thank you for being faithful in sharing. Thank you for being faithful in being a witness. Thank you for being faithful in praying for the person that is your one, for looking for these gospel conversations, these gospel interactions. You never know when God is going to give you one. I was right across the street earlier this week, and I was getting a Mountain Dew, and I was talking to the guy at the station. I said, hey, man, you go to church? And he says, no, not really. And I, I pointed out, I said, you ever been to that church? He looked. He said, no, I've never been. And he sat there and gave me a really weird look, Miss Krista. He says, but I know Russ Sander. And I was like, I was speechless. I didn't know how to approach him after that, whether I should be like, good, come, or I apologize. I didn't know. So I, I didn't know what to say. And so I just said, well, look, I'd love to have you come. You come meet our preacher. You'd like him, you know. And so <laughs> you never know when God's going to give you these opportunities just to, just to tell someone that God loves them, to invite them to church. And so I just want to encourage you to keep doing it. I'm thankful that you're doing it. I love that you're texting me. You're emailing me. Let me know that you're doing it. It just excites me and encourages me and convicts me to want to do it more. And so I love this. And so thank you for doing it. And I just want to encourage you while we have everyone here, if you're not in a Sunday school class, there's a great opportunity to get in one right after the service. And so if you don't go to Sunday school, if you missed our first Sunday school service, you can jump right in after this service. And if you want to know more about Sunday school, you can go right out to our Welcome Center out there, and we'll have some information about Sunday school classes and someone to direct you in those areas. If you got your Bible this morning, I want to ask you if you would open to Acts chapter 2. We're going to find ourselves in Acts chapter 2 in verses 14 through 41. We won't look and read every individual verse, but those that is going to be the grouping of our text this morning. And in this section, we're introduced to the first evangelistic sermon in the New Testament. And it's really interesting when you think about first sermons or first time an individual is speaking on the Word of God. And as I was reading Peter's account, Peter's first sermon here, it reminded me of the first time I, I ever spoke in front of anyone for anything. I was in high school. I was a senior. We had a CU at the poll rally, and my principal just came to me the day before and said, Brad, uh, I'd like you to speak at CU at the poll. And Miss Betty, I was like, I don't think we, you want what you think you want. He said, no, it'll be good. And that was it. He didn't tell me what to do. He didn't tell me what to say. He didn't tell you use a Bible, nothing. He just said, speak. Said, All right, we're going to do this. And so we had a bunch of donuts out there and everything. And everybody ate the donuts, and it was good. And they said, and he came up to me and said, look, it's time to speak. Well, your knees start getting weak at that point, and you get real shaky, and your hands start getting sweaty, and your throat starts clamming up. And so the only way I could think in my 18-year-old, 17-year-old mind to conquer that was to do something ridiculous. So I jumped up on the table, and I simply, John, this was my first words to ever speak on behalf of the Lord. This is embarrassing. I said, can I get a what, what, and a whoop, whoop for Jesus? <laughs> and that was it. <laughs> that, was, that was it. I got off the table after that. That was, that was all I had in me was a what, what, and a whoop, whoop. Thankfully, Peter's sermon is a little more biblically based than that. And it cut to the heart of the listener. One of the things that sticks out in this particular sermon is the reality of the messenger of the Word of God. This first sermon of the church comes from Peter. Peter, if you remember, Peter, if you recognize, is the same Peter who just weeks earlier denied Jesus Christ. Just weeks earlier, he shied away from people when it mattered the most. Who was not a trained preacher or a trained speaker. He literally ran from responsibility when it came to him. But what happens to Peter here is he has something to say and he says it in the power of the Spirit of God. When we find ourselves living for the gospel, the Spirit of God will empower you to do what God's called you to do. If you're obedient to pray for the lost, guess what? God's going to give you opportunity to be a witness. If you're obedient to, to serve in a ministry position in the church, God is going to give you an opportunity to do that service. If you're obedient to do what God's called you to do, He will empower you to do the very thing He's called you to do. 
Peter was able to come. He was able to stand. He was able to speak about the gospel because it was the gospel that changed his life. I wonder often if we don't speak more about the gospel because it may not have made a bigger difference in our life as it did for Peter. You see, we often think we need something to be able to speak on behalf of the Lord. We need a theology degree or we need a preaching certificate to tell someone what Christ has done for us. But we don't see that in this passage. There's two main outcomes from this passage we see this morning that I want us to get. Number one, if you are in Christ, means if you're here this morning, if you're watching online, and if you know Jesus personally, you have a relationship with him. Listen, the gospel message is still for you. Too often, we forget that we are to preach the death and the burial and the resurrection of Christ to ourselves every single day because it still matters today. It doesn't matter if you've been a Christian five minutes or 50 years. The gospel is still important in our lives today. And just as it is important in our lives to know and to practice and to live in and to be empowered by, it is just as important for those of us who are in Christ to share the gospel message. And if you're here today and you don't know Christ, I want to invite you today to really lean in and listen. I want you to hear how Jesus died for you. I want you to know how you can have a life-changing, life-giving encounter with the Savior. How you can walk out of these doors today as a child of God, redeemed by Jesus. You can know peace and comfort. You can know true freedom. But more importantly, you can know Jesus and the redemption that he offers in his life. Today's passage shows us the power of of the gospel, that the gospel message is a call, a clarion call for all people, and that we're called to share it and we're called to live in it. We'll see Jesus was crucified, that Jesus was resurrected, and that Jesus was exalted. Father God, would you speak to us now on behalf of your word and the power of your spirit? God, would you draw us to the cross this morning? That we would see Jesus. That we would see him high and lifted up. That we would see him as the Messiah, the Christ, our Lord, the holy and exalted one. Oh Lord, would you glorify yourself today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The first thing we'll see is that the gospel was prophesied in the Old Testament. The people think, if you remember, coming out of verses 1 through 13, the people start speaking in the tongues of the languages. There's about 15 different nations, so they're speaking in about 15 different languages. Well, they hear this. Some people hear the word of God. Some people hear the gospel. And then some antagonists say, well, hold up. These people are drunk. Peter comes and he says, look, these people ain't drunk. It's only 9 a.m. They ain't got time to get drunk yet, right? And so he says, they're they're not drunk. Uh, But what they are, they're not filled with wine, but they're filled with the Spirit. And so before diving into the specific points of the gospel, Peter, Peter spends a little time in the Old Testament showing that what was happening there to counter their their thoughts, to counter their their misinterpretation of the event about the people being drunk and not filled with spirit, Peter then refers back to an Old Testament passage foretelling the pouring out of the spirit. And he does this start in verse 16. But this is what was spoken of through the prophet Joel. And it shall be in the last days, God says, that I will pour forth my spirit on all mankind, And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my bond slaves, both men and women, I will in those days pour forth of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. So the beginning of Peter's sermon, his his foundational text right here in this passage in Acts, is taken out of Joel chapter 2, verses 28 through 32. And Joel is coming and he's prophesying on the hills of a famine and a plague. So Israel is destitute at this point in Joel's history where he's prophesying to them. And so they're, they're hopeless, they have nothing. But Joel prophesies of a time to come of a reawakening, if you will, that God is going to come and God is going to pour out his spirit upon the people and they will prophesy and they will have life. 
What Joel didn't know is that what he was prophesying about wasn't just to the people of Israel, but God was going to pour out his spirit upon all those who call upon the name, and they would prophesy about the life-giving change that the Messiah had to offer. Peter said exactly what was taking place. These 120 people were filled with the Spirit of God. Now they prophesy. They speak the word of the Lord concerning Jesus. But in this particular passage right here, the most important verse in this section is from verse 21, which Peter quotes Joel, and he makes this statement, church. And it should be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This is what the people heard. This is what the message was, was taking place when the people were speaking in tongues. They were speaking of the glories of God in Christ, telling each other and each person in his or her language how they can know God through Jesus. But notice what Peter says. Notice his words. Notice what he uses before he preaches them. That God declared through Joel that every single person who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Beloved, the gospel is for all people. There is none who will be excluded from the fold. None who will be denied forgiveness. None who will miss salvation that ask for, that place their faith in Jesus Christ. You ever been denied something? Entering to a club, a party, or a team? I remember when I was nine years old and, and the baseball season had ended and uh, all the teams, we, we, they did it different back then. All the teams, after they played championship game, and everybody was there in the tournament, and all the teams would come, and they would sit out in your little team piles. And then from there, with all the teams, they would call out the kids on the all-star team. And I remember sitting there, uh, Brother Joe, and they didn't call my name. I don't know what was wrong with them. I, they must have missed something. I don't know. But I remember sitting there. I, I mean, it was the most humiliating feeling in the world. To think that you belong on a team and to be denied. To think that you are supposed to have part of something. To want it so bad and be denied it. And I, 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 what I purposed in my head was that I was going to work so hard the next year and make me a spot. I was going to earn my spot on next year's All-Star team. And a lot of us. We think we get that mindset that my life doesn't live up. I didn't make the team, as it were, so I'll do what I can to earn my way, to earn God's favor, to outdo the wrongs that I've done. But, beloved, that is not the gospel message. We can never earn God's favor. We can never earn God's blessing. We can never work hard enough to outdo our sin. Salvation is for those who call upon the Lord, not for those who work their way to the Lord. What happens when we think there is no hope for us? We either give up or we work extra hard to earn a spot. In vain, we either run or we give up. But there's a better way. And that way is simply placing our faith in Jesus Christ. Peter here shows us the gospel is for all people at all times, all cultures, all ethnicities. No matter our past, the gospel is for you. You just need to call upon the Lord. This is why we as a church do what we do. This is why we do local ministry and missions here. This is why our giving supports the cooperative program at Southern Baptist. We give to support missionaries, thousands of missionaries here in the United States, church plants here in the United States, and thousands of missionaries across the world because we believe in the words that Peter spoke today, that all of those who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. No matter your past, no matter your sin, no matter what's going on in your life right now, no matter what you think about your future, the gospel is for you. And after showing these individuals listening here how these disciples were fulfilling this Old Testament prophecy, Peter shifts his attention now to focus on Jesus' ministry and how it was Jesus' ministry that was authenticated by God. Look at verse 22. Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders, and signs which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourself know. The humble carpenter from Nazareth, Peter is saying, was the Messiah. We know this. Peter says we can know that Jesus 
was the Messiah. And we can know that because it was God the Father that authenticated. He put his stamp, his seal of approval on the life of Jesus. And he did this, Peter says, through three particular ways prior to even getting to the death of Jesus. The life of Jesus was acceptable to God and, and, and as the Messiah because of wonders and signs and miracles. He empowered Jesus to perform these miracles, and miracles are simply works of power. You think where he's at the wedding in Canaan turns water into wine, right? The first miracle. He does wonders. These are acts of supernatural things with, with spiritual meaning in them. Think of, of turning the fish and the loaves, right, for the 4,000 and the 5,000. And he does signs. These are true acts of divine activity. Think of raising Lazarus from the dead, that God the Father authenticated, he approved, he empowered Jesus' ministry because Jesus was the Messiah. He was fully proven throughout his life to be the one that was prophesied from old. It was vital for Peter to remind these Jews of Jesus' divinity and his heavenly approval. They needed to know that the Jesus being proclaimed to them was divine, and he was truly the Messiah. And beloved, that fact, that truth, the importance and the weight of that statement is still as valid today as it was 2,000 years ago. So often we get lost in the weeds, in, in, in our witnessing, in our trying to live for Christ, when all we have to do is tell them, show them, use the word of God to display that Jesus is the only one of God. He is the true son. He is the Messiah. He is still as relevant today as he was 2,000 years ago. Jesus and Jesus alone is the hope of the world. We can look and we can observe the destruction of the world right now. We can see the degrading of our morality literally minute by minute. We can see the capitulating of Christian values and virtues. We see it all across the world. We see it on the highest levels of government, and we see it every day in churches. The world doesn't need another piece of advice. It doesn't need another piece of legislation. It doesn't need people to become more comfortable with who, them, who their true self is. We don't need greater self-esteem. What we need is the real, authentic Messiah who is Jesus Christ. And from this platform... Peter is going to lay out three crucial parts of the gospel. The crucifixion, the resurrection, and the exaltation of Jesus. He's going to show us in verse 23 that Jesus was crucified. And he moves to the reality that the death of Jesus and the truth that every person is complicit in his death. Look at verse 23. This man delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God meaning God had already planned this whole thing. You nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. Peter now hits them where it hurts. They come in, think of this, they're coming in and they're running saying, oh, you people are just drunkards, it's nine in the morning and you're already drunk. Peter says, wait, 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 they're not drunk. They're filled with the Spirit of God because they're filled with what God said was going to happen. They're prophesying about Jesus, the Jesus that was crucified, the Jesus that was crucified by you. Boy, talk about how the tables had turned. You ever been pointing the finger at someone? You ever been telling them how wrong they were? And then they make one simple statement and you realize the whole time you're the one that's wrong? If you're a husband, you know exactly what that feels like. <laughs> in this crowd, no doubt there were people in that crowd when, who when Pilate asked, do you want Barabbas or Jesus to be freed? There were individuals in that crowd who shouted, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. They knew exactly what Peter was talking about because they were there that day. He says, sinful men acted sinfully to kill God's son. But no, please know this. That did not take God by surprise. The death of Jesus did not take God by surprise. That was God's plan all along to deal with our sin was the death of Jesus. God appointed Jesus unto death. Jesus was born a virgin, of a virgin that he may die on the cross. But listen to these words. How powerful, how poignant are these words? Imagine being there. Imagine Peter gazing into your eyes. And you hear the words. You nailed him 
to the cross. He doesn't sugarcoat it. Your sin, you nailed him to the cross. And for the record, we're sitting here 2,000 years removed in a very comfortable building, and we have to know that Peter's words aren't just true for those he was speaking to that day. They're true for you and I this morning. There's a song by the sidewalk prophets titled, You Love Me Anyway, and some of the lyrics says, I am the thorn in your crown, but you love me anyway. I am the sweat from your brow, but you love me anyway. I am the nail in your wrist, but you love me anyway. I am Judas's kiss, but you love me anyway. See, now I am the man who yelled out from the crowd for your blood to be spilled on, earth, on this earth-shaking ground. Yes, then I turned away with a smile on my face. With this sin in my heart, I tried to bury your grace. Church, we need to realize a very important doctrinal truth this morning. Our sin nailed Jesus to that cross. It was not some random Roman soldier. Sure, he may have had the hammer in his hand, but it might as just as well have been you or I. Let me get personal for a minute. It was my pride that killed Jesus. It was your jealousy. It was my fear. It was your adultery. It, it, it was our lust. It was our anger. It was our greed. It was our self-idolatry that held Jesus to that cross for which he died. It was us. It was me. Peter shows them this. He shows them the gravity of the weight of the death of Jesus because sin has to be confronted head on. It has to be addressed. There has to be recognition of our great need and our brokenness and our headed straight to hell so that true repentance can take place. True repentance will never take place if we just tiptoe around our sin. But true repentance will take place when we feel the full weight of our sin hanging upon Jesus on that cross. In our culture, it is popular to blunt the razor-sharp edge of the gospel so as to make it more easily acceptable. But the church's first sermon preached by Peter goes right for the heart. We ask, why is there a need to be so upfront and honest about the reality of my sin? Because sin is horrible. And it is the reason that Jesus died. We are the reason that Jesus died. Peter addresses this. He reminds you and I this morning of the actual physical crucifixion of the death of Jesus. It's the crux on which the gospel hinges. If there's no real, no physical death, then there is no forgiveness of sin. So we recognize the horrendous nature of our sins that we may be forgiven of them, washed clean and white as snow. Realizing that we are the reason that crimson blood dripped down but realizing those same drops that we caused are the very drops that cover us and wash us white as snow. And for the believer this morning, Jesus' death is an example of how we are to die to ourselves each day. We are to walk in courage and humility and constant repentance because we are walking in Christ. And if you're here this morning, you do not have a relationship with Christ. You, you may have been here a lot of times. You may have been playing church for many years. You, you may have your name on some church's membership role. It may be this role. You may have been dunked in that baptistry, and that's well and good and fine. You may think you got it all together. But let me tell you, if you've never repented, if your heart has never turned, if it's never changed, if it's never went towards Christ away from your sin, then you've never been saved. Jesus was crucified. He was also resurrected. Look at verse 24. But God, Peter says, raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death since it was impossible for him to be held by its power. Jesus not only lived and died, it was impossible to be held by its power. How beautiful is that? In verses 25 through 28, Peter quotes from Psalm 16, verses 8 through 11, in which David prophesies about the coming Messiah, and he says the coming Messiah will conquer death. David placed his hope of his personal resurrection upon the conquering Messiah's 
winning victory over death. Paul even says in 1 Corinthians 15, 56 through 57, this is one of my favorite passages to use at the graveside. The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. If the Messiah was supposed to rise from the dead and Jesus rose from the dead, Peter says, guess what? (laughs) Jesus is the Messiah. His resurrection demonstrates that he was who he said he was and he could do what he said he would do. Death had no power over him. Peter says, we were witnesses. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, Paul says, there were over 500 witnesses. So we can tell you that the same Jesus who was on that cross, the same Jesus who was put in that tomb, is the same Jesus who kicked that stone out of the way and walked out. He conquered death. The reason the resurrection is so important, church, is because if the resurrection is false, Paul says our faith is false also. Because the resurrection proves the death of Jesus satisfied God's requirements on the cross. We can know for sure that our faith is solid and it stands on solid ground because Jesus conquered death. It had no power over him. Of all the prophets, of all the teachers, of all the mystics and sages, none of them, not a single one, has ever escaped death. Jesus didn't simply escape death. He came, he conquered it, he defeated the enemy of life and the the, the death as the companion of sin. He didn't just come and say, death, I got a 51 and 50 victory over you. Death didn't score a point. He beat it so handily, so soundly. So we got to know that Jesus absolutely, we proclaim him was crucified. But we absolutely, in the same breath, we say he was resurrected. Because notice what Peter says. I love this line. It was impossible. It was impossible for death to hold him. I got this, this old, old song, Crab Family song. I really like it. Southern Gospel uh, says, ain't no grave going to hold me down. I'm not going to sing it right now, but I really want to. If I did, I'd get in trouble when I got home. So I'm not. He was crucified. He was resurrected. But look at verse 33. He was exalted. Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured forth this which you both see and hear. Jesus, following his resurrection, he ascended to heaven and he now sits at the right hand hand of the Father right now. Paul says he sits at the right hand of the Father, Romans 8, 34, interceding for you. Think about this. I, I, we had a conversation about this the other day. Uh, I had with a few guys. Jesus Christ, the conqueror of death, the Savior, our Redeemer, he is sitting there interceding on our behalf. He is actively praying for you. There is no need to ever think about, ever for a hint or a minute, ever pray to someone else besides Jesus. Let's just pretend for a minute that you could pray to someone else, which is absolutely illogical. Why would you pray to number two when you can always pray to the champion? Why would you do it? Jesus has been exalted to the right hand of the Father. And he's sitting there right now. Think about this. When you're depressed, when you're anxious, when you just fail, when you just committed this horrible sin, guess what? Jesus is right there on behalf of you saying, God, guess what? I I got her. God, I I, I know that that the guy, he's struggling with with fear in his life right now, but but God, let's, let's... Let's give him some strength, Father. I I know that young lady has some depression in her life, Father, but guess what? I want you to know that I've never left her. We've poured my spirit of God. Would you strengthen her? Know that Jesus, when you're going through whatever you're going through, when your marriage is rough, when finances are hard, when sin has got you beat down, Jesus is exalted to the Father so that he may intercede for you until you get back to him. That's why we say Jesus will never leave us. He will never forsake us. He is right there with us in the midst of what's going on in our lives. The exaltation of Jesus. Jesus ascending to heaven, going to sit in heaven with the Father, demonstrates that he is fully God, no longer on earth, but in heaven right now, conversing to the Father on our behalf. 
Verse 34 says, For it is not David who ascended into heaven, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool. David is prophesying. He shows the father telling the son to sit at his right hand until he makes his enemies his footstool, until he glorifies Christ above all. We know that day is coming. And the evidence leads Peter to make this statement in verse 36. Because Jesus has been crucified, because Jesus has been resurrected, because Jesus has been exalted, the only logical conclusion is that Jesus Christ is Lord. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know, verse 36, for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. How beautiful of a thought is that church? This Peter, who just a few weeks earlier denied Christ, now preaching the church's first sermon, recounting the divinity of Jesus, the death of Christ, the resurrection of Christ, the ascension of Christ, and the glory of Christ. Now here is where we really got to pay attention. If you haven't been paying attention, if your neighbor's been sleeping, give him a little nudge. It's okay. Look, I used to have a guy in the choir. He sat right in the middle Within 30 seconds of me preaching, he'd fall asleep every Sunday. So I understand you may be sleeping, but nudge that person if they are, because there's something really important about to talk about. Peter declares that Jesus Christ is Lord. He declares the reality of the resurrection. He declares the reality of the crucifixion. He declares the truth of the exaltation. Now listen to what takes place in verse 37. Now, when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? Peter said to them, Repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off. As many as the Lord our God will call to himself. The only, the only, the only proper response to the gospel is repentance and faith. There is no other response. So with that said, if you are here this morning and you've never responded in placing your faith in the finished work of Jesus on the cross, you've never asked God to truly, heartfelt,ly with sincerity, forgive you of your sins, do so today. They heard. They understood. They were convicted by the Spirit, the same Spirit who had poured out Himself upon the people who empowered these 120 to prophesy, who empowered Peter to preach. He comes and he convicts. And notice what the text says. The Spirit of God came and pierced their hearts. Their hearts were wrought open. What does that mean in layman's terms? They were convicted of their sin. Are you convicted of your sin this morning? Does it bother you That you sin against a holy and a righteous God who has all right and reason to damn all of us to hell outside of Jesus Christ. Does that bother us? It should. It should grieve every one of us. You say, preacher, this is is getting deep. Should have brought your boots. I'm sorry. But we preach this gospel because it literally is the foundation of the church. The proper response to the gospel message is repentance. They knew they were sinners. They knew they were not right with God. They knew they needed Jesus. The proper response to the gospel is repentance. And true repentance causes a change of heart. It causes a change of mind. The gospel comes and it shows us our sin. And it shows us the price of our sin is death and hell. You say, well, I feel sorry for my sin That's not repentance. Paul makes this statement in Corinthians. He says, look, he's writing to them and he says, I'm glad that I hurt your feelings. I'm glad I made you upset because your hurt feelings, your anger led you to be truly godly sorrowful. He said, because worldly sorrow, just feeling bad about something leads to nothing. 
it leads to death. But godly sorrow, being convicted and following through with that conviction of repentance, leads to forgiveness and freedom. They were pierced to the heart. They just didn't feel bad about what they did. And there's, we want to feel bad about sin, but our feeling bad, our guilt, our shame, if we just let shame just, just weigh on us, it just sinks us down. But true conviction leads us to Jesus, the only one who can remove the weight of sin and wash us of our shame. Repentance is seeing our sin as a criminal offense against God and turning and asking for forgiveness. And even believers here this morning, we need to respond in repentance throughout our life. Every one of us. Diedrich Bonhoeffer makes this statement, lack of repentance is the root cause of powerlessness in the church, in this materialistic, self-indulgent age. There can be no spiritual power in a non-repentant church. Following belief in Christ, Peter instructs him to be baptized. Peter lets them know that believing in Christ will result in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Following repentance, believers should, every one of us, follow through with baptism, showing the world that we are now identified fully with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. There's some confusion here with verse 38. Peter makes a statement. I just want to cover this for a moment to help clear up some confusion if there is any. So Peter says in verse 38, Repent and each of you Be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Some individuals incorrectly state that baptism is a requirement for salvation. That's unnecessary. You read through the whole of the New Testament, you don't get that. So if we know this one verse says one thing, and it contradicts everything else in the the, the rest of the Bible, or the rest of the New Testament, then we are incorrectly interpreting this verse, right? So we know that. The confusion here comes in our translation of the text, in the English translation of the word for. Uh, in the Greek language, it's the word ice, and it can be translated several ways. But the best, the most accurate translation for this passage, as we read this for, should be understood as in respect to or as a result of. Meaning, repent and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ as a result of the forgiveness of your sins. As a result of repenting and being baptized by the Holy Spirit, we are to be baptized physically. Since the New Testament as a whole does not teach baptism as a requirement of salvation, but it does teach baptism as an obedient act after salvation, we can know that Peter is speaking here of baptism as a result of salvation in the indwelling of the Spirit. So we come and we ask the question as we get ready to close this morning. Have you repented of your sins? Have you received God's forgiveness? Have you been filled with the Holy Spirit this morning? This message is a simple message which gives a foundation for everything else that's going to take place in the book of Acts. And it's a gospel message. Are you here this morning? Are you here this morning and you need to give your life to Jesus? Would you do so this morning? As we stand, as Brother James comes, we've heard of the life and the death, the resurrection and the exaltation of Jesus. How will we respond to the gospel this morning? Maybe you're here this morning and you're a believer and you say, you know what, I've just been living, I've been walking in continual sin and I need to repent of that this morning. You can do that. Maybe you're here and you say, you know what, I need to follow through in believer's baptism. You can can follow through with that and you can let us know and we can get that process started. Maybe you're here today and you don't have a relationship with Jesus. In just a moment, we're going to pray and we're going to sing and if you're here this morning and you don't have a relationship with Jesus might I ask you to give your life to him this morning now you can come forward and and, and, and tell me you can do it right in your seat but if you do we want to know about it because we want to help you and celebrate that we want to call you to the cross this morning call you to Jesus this morning I'm going to pray and then we're going to respond to the Holy Spirit's conviction on us this morning